Okay, hey everybody. Hopefully everyone can hear me. My name is Alora Sweeney and I'm currently interning as a Coastal Stewardship Council or Coastal Stewardship Assistant with the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. So I'm a member of the Canadian Conservation Corps, a youth program through the Canadian Service Corps in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. So this program immerses Canadian youth in hands-on conservation and environmental learning and education outreach by teaming up with different experts and organizations in the conservation field across Canada. It's an awesome program and I'm loving it so far. So there is a Q&A section if you are interested um, in having any questions answered. So we'll go over those um, at the end of the webinar here. Uh, I may not be able to have all the answers since I'm just an intern, but I will definitely try my best to answer them um, or at least get back to you on uh, any questions that you may have. All right. So before we get started, I do want to take some time to thank our generous sponsors. So this webinar series would not be possible without the continued support of our sponsors. So thank you very much to RBC and Bruce Power. You support, they're supporters of many of our initiatives and we're very grateful for their support. So thank you so much. So who are we at the Coastal Center? So the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation is a nonprofit charitable organization that was founded in 1998 with the goals of protect, protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment and promoting a healthy ecosystem within that environment. We have a small and mighty team of three full-time staff members, with the help of summer interns such as myself, a volunteer board of directors, consultants, and advisors. The Coastal Center focuses to help protect and preserve the entire Canadian shoreline of Lake Huron by conducting community-based projects and outreach initiatives such as community beach cleanups and our science-based citizen science project, Coast Watchers. The data collected by our Coast Watcher volunteers get entered into a national database, which, which helps uh, researchers and scientists to track conditions and trends along the coastline. So I actually just organized my first beach cleanup in Kincardine this past weekend, uh, where we ended up getting 80 volunteers and picked up 200 pounds of garbage off our shoreline. So thank you for joining the fourth installment of our six part webinar series. So today the topic that I'll be highlighting is our species at risk. So at the Coastal Center, we spend 100% of every day on Lake Huron issues. With our main focus from Sarnia all the way up to Tobermory, we'll work anywhere along the Canadian shoreline of Lake Huron, working on a variety of environmental issues, restoration projects, and education outreach products. Projects, sorry. So, species at risk and their habitat. This is a piping plover, a little chick, and I believe this was actually at Sauble Beach. I got to see my first one this year, and they're so cute. So what is a species at risk? So a species, whether it be a plant or an animal, that is under threat of being endangered, extirpated, or even extinct from habitat loss, degradation, human caused stressors such as ATVing, clear cutting, and climate change. And their habitats. So we went over what an at-risk species is, and now we'll learn what many of them have in common, which is more and more of their habitats are unfortunately threatened every single day. So what is a habitat? The habitat of a species is defined as the space that a species needs in order to live and grow. 
The space must contain such things as food, water, living space, and shelter from weather events and predators. Each species depends on a specific habitat in order to survive. If this habitat is destroyed, individuals may not be able to survive or reproduce, and the species can actually become at risk that way. We have a few levels of risk. We have special concern, threatened, endangered, and extirpated. So these are the four main levels of risk. A group of experts using the best science and traditional knowledge available determines what level of risk to assign the species that are at risk. So we'll go over them in more details and have a few examples of each animals and plants and their habitats. So first off, we'll tackle special concern. So special concern is defined as a species that lives in the wild, but at risk of becoming threatened due to a combination of biological characteristics and identified threats. So monarchs are a special concern here on Ontario, and their habitats include open woodlands, fields and meadows, marshes, roadsides, and gardens. So their diet consists of a nectar from a variety of native flowers, but they're primarily fed, they primarily feed on common milkweed. So the milky sap from the milkweed plant produces a toxin called cardinalides, also known as cardiac glucosides, which make them very distasteful for predatory birds. So what threatens it? Widespread pesticide and herbicide use, habitat loss and fragmentation of their overwintering sites in central Mexico due to forests being logged and converted into agricultural lands. An example of a special concern plant or tree in this case is the Schumard oak. So Schumard oaks prefer moist soils and can grow close to water and swampy areas. And since these trees enjoy their life close to water and swampy areas, they actually help with water quality and erosion. Their roots absorb excess nutrients and other contaminants, acting as a natural filtration system. Not to mention they are a great carbon sink. The leaves help slow down the flow of rain and their root system helps keep soil in place, which helps reduce the risk of erosion. So what threatens this? As trees mainly grow along fence rows, they're at risk from fence, fence row brushing and field clearing, and large forested trees may be taken for logging. And our threatened species here that I have, very near and dear to my heart because I'm aiding in field research actually of this beautiful and misunderstood creature. So this here is an eastern hognose snake. Um, the threatened species that is defined as the species that is found in the wild but is more vulnerable and closer to becoming endangered if threats are not addressed. So with these guys, they are a non-venomous snake that gives the appearance of being threatening since it hisses and flares up to resemble a cobra. And it may end up striking if provoked. And I've had a few that have stri striked me, <laughs> but they're completely harmless. Bites are quite rare since they strike with their mouth closed, not really the sharpest tool in the shed. So last case scenario, they will coil up onto their back and expose their belly open their mouth and play dead as shown in this picture. They're mainly found in sandy soils and well-drained habitats such as beaches, dry forest. They use their upturned snout to dig burrows in the sandy soils come nesting season. So what's threatening our hogs? Like most species, 
they're threatened with habitat loss and fragmentation. An increasing threat is road mortalities. They're especially mobile around mating and nesting seasons. So please break for our snakes. Here we have the pitcher's thistle, which is actually globally rare and exclusively found on the open sand dunes and the low beach ridges of the Great Lakes Basin. So that's pretty cool. This plant's life cycle includes a long three to 11 year growth period. And once its seeds form and disperse, the entire plant dies. This unassuming plant is important to the ecology of the dunes that they inhabit and are effective sand stabilizers, which help prevent erosion. So the main threats here are, again, habitat loss and degradation from urban development. Is anybody surprised about that? Excessive recreational use of beaches, including ATV use on sand dunes, and probably a decline in pollinators may also play a part in their decline as well. So Pinery and Inver Huron Provincial Park actually help protect this species by prohibiting vehicle use and trampling that have led to the destruction of this plant. On the endangered list, we have the piping plover here. So this is a species that can be found in the wild, but is in serious danger of becoming extirpated. There's greater concern for their conservation to prevent possible extinction. So we don't want that to happen. So these tiny shorebirds spend a majority of their time on the shorelines on dry, sandy, or gravelly beaches where they also exclusively nest. The primary threat to piping plovers is human disturbance. One of the most recent conflicting issues is grooming of beaches. And since they occupy the shoreline, they use the shoreline debris as one of their main food sources of insects and crustaceans and other invertebrates. When heavy machinery is used to groom these beaches, not only is that source of grooming or diet groomed away, but the removal of the willow bushes and other vegetation means the removal of their natural hiding places, making them their eggs and their chicks vulnerable to predation. An example of an endangered plant here in Ontario is the four-leaved milkweed, also known as world milkweed. So they're found in dry woodlands and woodland alvar dominated by red cedar and pasture grasses. Threats to the world milkweed include habitat loss due to residential and agricultural land uses and invasive plant species as well. One thing they've got going for them is just like the common milkweed I mentioned with the monarchs there, they produce a milky sap, hence the name. They also produce cardiac glucosides, which are the badly tasting chemical that's released making the plant toxic and unpalatable for most herbivores. So finally, we have extirpated. So this is defined as the population of a species ceasing to exist in a certain area. So other populations may exist elsewhere, but they may be at extreme risk of extinction. So this is kind of your last chance, if you will, to act for further protection of the species. Here we have an eastern box turtle, which are no longer found in Canada, presumably due to the extensive loss of forest cover and over harvest of food in the 1500s. They're very common in the pet trade, however, and it's thought that sightings in the 20th century have actually been released pets. And uh, it is to be mentioned that these captive animals should never be released into the wild as they have they would never survive in the winter. And there is a risk of introducing disease or parasites to other wild populations as well. 
Unfortunately, all eight of our turtle species found in Ontario are at risk, but there are ways that you can help, which we'll go over a little later in the webinar here. Some species have already disappeared completely from Canada. So right here we have the Plains grizzly bear. So they used to live on the prairies, but they no longer un exist, unfortunately. They disappeared in the 1800s with the advancement of European settlers and the advent of firearms. The recovery of the plains grizzly bear is not feasible in Canada anymore because there is not enough habitat left for them in the Canadian prairies. So Illinois tick trefoil grows in dry to moderately moist rich soils and it colonizes grassland areas opened up by burning or disturbance. So this prairie species is a member of the pea family and it was last located in 1888 at one location near London, but it has not been reported since. It may be possible that there's a small population in southwestern Ontario, but they can mostly be found in north central United States. It most likely disappeared due to grazing, mowing, and the, con the conversion of tall grass prairie to agriculture, with the help of introduction of invasive species, I'm sure. One thing that I haven't listed, which is worth mentioning, is extinction, which unfortunately is threatening a lot of our species. So mortality rates are usually statistically measured by the number of deaths per thousand people per year. And a study done by Stuart Pym, who is a conservation ecologist at Duke University, revealed some eye-opening data regarding extinction. According to this study, a rate of 100 to 1,000 species are lost per million per year, mostly due to human-caused habitat destruction and climate change. That is a large, large number. Earlier analysis showed that before humans evolved, less than a single species per million went extinct annually. From these examples, it's obvious humans are largely responsible for the mass destruction of this species. Some of whom have predated us by millions of years. And for some, it's already too late, but for others, imp impending Extinction is already inevitable. Fortunately, we do have laws in place to prevent decline of these endangered species, but we must act now. Here's a bit of a success story though. So this is the black-footed ferret, and they were listed as extirpated by 1978, and they were thought to be globally extinct due to a combination of plague, a loss of habitat, and a serious decline of their prey species, prairie dogs, as they make up 90% of their diet. So in 1981, a farmer in Wyoming found the carcass of a weasel-like animal that his dog Shep had killed. The next day he brought it to a local taxidermist who confirmed the species, which led researchers to a small population in the area. The Canadian Wildlife Federation has teamed up with the Toronto Zoo to facilitate a captive breeding program, which has reintroduced a population to Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. So their population now sits at around 300 to 400 or so. And the Calgary Zoo is also focusing on understanding the population dynamics of prairie dogs. So there is still a lot of work to do as plague and drought seems to be against them. But this is, the, this is a step in the right direction. By protecting the habitat of a species at risk, we hope to protect that species and prevent its extirpation. Why are all species important? 
The disappearance of one species can have large effect on other species. They are all part of a larger community. Each species plays a role in an ecosystem and removing that species can have far reaching effects on the entire community, us included. For example, here we have an American toad, which is the primary food source of our Eastern hognose snake population here in Canada. And without an abundance of this toad around, our hogs would not have an even harder time surviving than they already do. So habitat changes. Habitat changes affect all species in the area. For species that are already at risk, these changes can have strong negative effects from which the species may never be able to recover. Can you name some habitats that occur naturally? So lake level fluctuations can alter beaches and dunes particularly periods of high lake levels, which we're experiencing now. During low lake levels, the beach and dunes rebuild. So the photo on the left here is from the high lake level in about 1985 to 1986. And the photo on the right is actually the same beach area during low lake levels. So you can see there's quite a difference. Dune species have actually adapted to these dynamic conditions. We also have weather events. So storms and other weather events, such as tornadoes and flooding and drought can change the habitat of many species. Storms can destroy beaches and cause flooding Tornadoes cause high winds that can topple trees and drought directly influences the type of plants that will grow and how much they will grow in that area. So can you list some habitat changes that are caused by humans? Recreational activities such as ATV use can destroy the habitat of many rare beach species. Other examples include beach grooming machines, pulling out dune vegetation to clear your towel real estate for sunbathers, and trampling dune vegetation in an effort to get to the beach. We also have pollution. This is a huge one. So pollution causes many habitat changes. The effects can be very far reaching. Fertilizer used to grow a crop can leach into a nearby lake and create chemical levels in the lake that are not suitable for the fish. Car exhaust as well causes acid rain, which can harm trees and change the chemistry of lakes so that fish cannot survive. And here we have a, a little diagram showing the different, the different pollution. So how do human caused habitat changes differ from naturally caused, caused changes? Well, human caused habitat changes often cause long term effects that are permanent. Species are often negatively affected by these sudden unexpected changes to which they can often not adapt. So the effects of natural habitat changes are usually temporary and reversible. They're often a natural process within the ecosystem and species have learned to live by these habits and have evolved with these natural changes and have adapted to them. So what are we doing to protect our species at risk? So we have a few things. We have the Species at Risk Act, which is a federal law that aims to protect all native species in Canada. It does this through both protection of the species itself and recovering actions for the species. 
Next, we have Endangered Species Act. So in Ontario, there's the Endangered Species Act, which was started in 2007, I believe. As soon as a species is listed as extirpated, endangered, or threatened, it is automatically protected from harm. Also, immediately upon listing, the general habitats of the endangered and threatened species are automatically protected from damage or destruction. And last, we have COSIWIC, which stands for the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. This was established in 2003, and it is an independent advisory panel to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada. They meet twice a year to assess the status of wildlife species at risk of extinction. So this act only applies to those wildlife species that are the official species at risk. So members of Kasiwek include wildlife biology experts from academia, government and non-governmental organizations, and the private sector responsible for designated wildlife species in danger of disappearing in Canada. So once a species is listed at one of these levels under the Species at Risk Act, it is illegal to kill, harm, harass, capture, or take an individual of a species listed as threatened, endangered, or extirpated. It's also illegal to possess, collect, buy, sell, or trade an individual of a species listed as threatened, endangered, or extirpated, or any part or derivative of such an individual. Also, damage or destroy the residence of one or more individuals of a species listed as threatened, endangered, or extirpated. So what can we do to help our species at risk? Well, if you find an injured turtle, this is a good place to start on what you can do. So you contact the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center, home of the Kawartha Turtle Trauma Center. They treat and release injured turtles and have a network of volunteer turtle taxi drivers. You can place the turtle in a dry, secure container with air holes and keep it in the shade. Do not give the turtle any food or water. Try to limit the handling and wash your hands afterwards as they do you can contact um, salmonella from them. So note the location of, that the turtle was found and report the sighting to the Ontario Reptile and Amphibious, Amphibian Atlas. And even if the turtle is dead, report it anyway, as eggs may be recovered if it is within net, nesting season. What you can do. If you see a species at risk, please keep this information to yourself. Telling other people, such as neighbors in that area, will not help the species at all. Many species at risk can be extremely vulnerable to poaching and habitat destruction. You can report a sighting by emailing the Natural Heritage Information Center, which is listed here. Using research apps like iNaturalist, eBird, Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, and Ontario Butterfly Atlas. I recommend everybody to download iNaturalist. It is a wonderful, wonderful app. If you do have a sighting of poaching, you can report it to the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, and the phone number is listed here. And if you want to learn more about species at risk, make sure to visit our website. And how can you help? You can volunteer or donate to your favorite grassroots organization. So we have a few listed here. And uh, one that's very important as well is your local wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, most of the time they 
aren't government funded. Um, there's very few grants out there that they are able to get. Um, so they rely very heavily on donations and they do very important work. Um, and also very important is just be a good steward. Um, as, as a private landowner, you may be eligible for stewardship programs that support the protection and recovery of species at risk and their habitats. So we went over what a species at risk is in the first place. Usually a combination of things with a common theme being habitat destruction. Protecting these unique habitats are vital in the fight for survival of their species. Some everyday dangers they face which ultimately leads to their decline, again habitat destruction and fragmentation, increase of invasive plant species, limited source of food, etc. And our protections available are listed federally and provincially to help protect our vulnerable species and what we can do. So volunteer, donate, support, and educate. And that is the end of my webinar. Thank you for bearing with me. This is my first time. <laughs> um, so you could be be sure to register for our next webinar on water quality, scheduled next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we can uh, go through those. Doesn't look like we have any questions, but um, if you guys do, then feel free to send us an email and uh, yeah, we'll look into it for you. Thank you very much.